Well, thank you for joining us with Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And each week we invite you to send in your questions and we'll explore the fascinating stories of Mississauga and beyond each and every week here on Ask a Historian. Please like, fo follow and subscribe and stay up to date on all the heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. Joining us this week for Ask a Historian is Samantha Thompson from the Region of Peel Archives at PAMA, who is going to share a fascinating journey of discovery that uh, that she has uh, undergone and has uh, written a wonderful article on uh, at the uh, at the Region of Peel's uh, Archives blog post on the Whitehead Brothers of Malton, who were soldiers in the First World War um, who served and fell overseas three brothers from one family in Malton. Um, and it's, it's a story that has always stuck with me just in terms of a, a family's loss. And, and it wasn't until the records that you're going to kind of highlight of, 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 of what, uh, what you had to deal with, but also the, uh, the research that you undertook, Samantha, to, to really shed more light on this incredible story of, of, of a family's sacrifice in the First World War and uh, right here at home. So, Samantha, thank you for joining us and, and taking the time to highlight the, the incredible work that you've done and that you do through the archives. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, I, I, I was I had an opportunity. I saw I saw the, the social media post come out on the blog post about the Whitehead Brothers, and I thought, oh, and and I knew you had asked earlier about you know information pertaining to it, and we really didn't have a lot more than say service records and, and some or some of the small bios of it, and they've always, like I said, it, it intrigued me uh, as to as to the brothers and the family and what else we could learn, and then this the story unfolded, and I'm sure. For me, on the outside looking back, it was just a wonderful read. But for you, being in the middle of it and, and uncovering this stuff, it must have been quite the journey to uh, to explore this family. Yes, and um, the interesting thing is, you know, I wasn't looking for this story. It 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 came to me um, just by virtue of doing my job. So uh, it was next in line to be cataloged. So we're, as archivists, one of the many things we do is. Um, describe and catalog archival records so that they are findable and usable by the public. So part of that process is um, is making them, um, nav you know, people are able to interpret them and navigate them and, and we need to organize them uh, and write a description of that organization that, that gives you some context into what the documents are, uh, who, what, when, where and why type of thing. Um, but when we organize them, it's kind of a delicate dance because um, we want to preserve connections between those documents that actually um, are informational in themselves, but they're invisible. So, uh, you know, the, the kind of simplest example of that is say, um, say if you have a ticket stub and a photograph and a letter, if those are all separate, um, they're different records than if you know the ticket stub and the photograph are in closure to that letter. The actual physical objects don't change, but they're actually different records because all of a sudden you have this world that connects the, the ticket stub and the photo with that, the world of the letter writer, and, and there's a, a situation there. So when we're organizing records, we have to be careful not to disturb those kinds of bonds and just kind of group things based on say format, put all the tickets together and all the photographs together. And you can imagine with you know, large bodies of records, hundreds of boxes, um, it, it can be a challenge. But if there's no order at all, we, we need to establish one that kind of um, makes it uh, usable and understandable to someone. It isn't just a big blob of, of records that, that, that they're like a forest, they're just wandering in randomly. So when I approached these records, um, it, it was a small, you know, relatively small donation for us, just a sheaf of papers. And uh, it had little information from the donor because it was a, a distant relative by marriage. So um, you just do a quick sort of shuffle through and I could see that it was military records, uh, letters sent to uh, Elizabeth Whitehead and Malton a lot of um, kind of um, formal 
uh, communications from the war authorities in Ottawa. And there was one handwritten letter. So uh, I'm, I'm attracted to, to handwritten letters um, as it, because of the human touch. And um, I picked it up. It had a sensor seal on the envelope, uh, but no other information that would tell you who was writing. And uh, read the letter, and I, I think I'll just read it to you please, to please. give you an idea of what um, you know what what changed my day really. So um, it's written on 30th of March, 1917, to Mrs. R. Whitehead. So Elizabeth's husband was Robert uh, Malton, Ontario. Dear Madam, it is my sad duty to inform you of the death of your son. Private George Whitehead, number 696142. It was his first trip to the trenches, the evening of the fifth day of the tour, March 29th. We were shelled heavily and your two boys were manning the parapet. A few minutes before, the brother was with him, but fortunately was ordered into a dugout. That death was instantaneous, there is no doubt, and you may be proud to know that your boy, although a stranger to war, stood the test magnificently, a brave lad held in high esteem by all, and of whom we are all proud. The brother is well, and the boys do what little they can to cheer him. I trust he will be spared to return to you. In extending my sympathy, I trust you will take comfort in knowing that your son died heroically doing his duty. The sacrifice should not be in vain. I have the honor to be, Madam, your obedient servant, um, Lieutenant Carson of the 31st Battalion Canadian BEF France. So BEF is British Expeditionary Force. So, uh, you know, I'm sitting there at the table um, and I have what uh, I, I guess that you could call an archival spell, which is where uh, you could, sort of an altered state of consciousness where you the years kind of drop away and your surroundings drop away and you're kind of with the person, the people who were involved in, in, in producing and, and receiving this. And I, I thought about the, the lieutenant who would have been writing from a trench. Uh, with the sound of gunfire, just surrounded by mud, because you know this, this he was writing the day after, or the day off, depending. But we'll get to that. Um, you know, I thought about the trip the letter made um, from the front to uh, the the postal you know, censorship office, probably in Britain, um, and then to Canada. And I, I thought about, of course, the mother and. She would have been in a you know rural post office picking this up and getting a letter that was clearly military in origin but didn't recognize the handwriting what she must have thought before she opened it and did she open it there did she take the the wagon ride back home or a car ride um and open it at home and i thought about her holding the letter and and uh and then and then you know the there are some some sort of, uh, most archivists and historians have read letters like this. There's a typical kind of bromides that, you know, death was instantaneous, whether it was or not. Um, yeah. You know, this was, this was supposed to be a kind of a comfort to people. Uh, you know, the, the assurances that the person died heroically and not in vain. But then there was these kind of unusual um, angles about, the brother who's unnamed and and that he hoped that he would be spared of course I'm wondering who is this and was he spared and I had to find out so um I uh you know went started going through the rest of the pile and there was George's burial report and a, a letter um relating to the fact that the telegram in, 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 in informing her of this death had actually gone astray. So she got the handwritten letter first. And I, I'm, I'm thinking there, was, there were mistakes made and she may have been desperately hoping this was a mistake and, and written to the war records office um, and got this letter in reply saying, you know, I'm sorry, the telegram went astray. It went to Walton instead of Malton. And in fact, yes, he's dead. 
and uh, you know that these are the following things you need to do. So there was that, but then I'm going through the rest of the documents, and um, there's not only one other, one other brother, but two other brothers. And I, as an archivist, I'm okay. Is there any order to this? There was three envelopes that didn't seem to go with any of the documents because normally when you get envelopes and letters, there's that the the, uh, doc, the the letters will go with an envelope, and and that didn't seem to be the case. That the postmarks and the letters were completely unrelated, and on the the uh, envelopes there was in the upper left uh, a date and a cemetery, and there were three of those envelopes. So I sorted the piles uh, into, by name, by the, the soldier's name. Turns out there were three burial reports, three sons. And the letter, uh, the envelopes I could now see were probably containers. So they were, they were essentially memorializing, um, they, were, they were files to keep the documents on the brothers together. And, and that kind of speaks to you know, the mindset of the person that, that kept these records for so many years. And um, to, to sort of corroborate that sense, I noticed that if I organized the papers in a certain order, they just kind of folded in on each other as though I'm home. And uh, you know, if you try to fold papers together that haven't want been folded together before or that are, that the creases aren't exactly going the right way or even if the pages are in a different order, they, they, you, you can feel that it's not right. And this just collapsed into these three piles. So I just thought, you know, I got this sort of sense that um, there were stories there that needed to be told. I, it felt like a bit of a call. Um, and, and uh, I had the regimental numbers from the documents. The only thing I could tell from, there was three burial reports and then sort of cover letters for the burial reports and um, various administrative letters about wills and um, we'll let you know X and Y. And, but there was no, uh, it said when they were, when they, where they were buried, when they died and what they died of. So, the first to die was Robert of pneumonia in 1916. Next was George, and we know a little bit more about him because of the letter, the handwritten letter, uh, died in um, 1917. And the last was Arthur, and he must have been the brother who was with George, so that answered that question. And he died of, uh, died of his wounds. So George was killed in action. Um, Arthur died of wounds in 1918. But I, you know, I, I, I felt that we sort of owed it to them to find out where they died and, and, and anything else we could find out. So uh, the next thing was, you know, additional records that we didn't have. So that was the next step in the journey. Well, I was going to ask you questions about what grabbed you and why did you choose this, but I think you've answered all of those. I mean, I'm going along this journey with you now. I can feel the draw to the story, even though I've read your 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 article on this. Uh, you know, I can feel being pulled into it, and 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 it, it it tugs at the heartstrings. It really does. I mean, you're you're you you have this letter of you know sadness, but of hope that you know one of your sons still passed away. Now, presuming that officer who wrote that letter didn't know that the one brother, Robert, had already died. Maybe, maybe that was a little unknown. So, you know, at this point, George losing his life just on the eve of the Battle of Vimy, of Vimy Ridge, uh, uh, you know, there's the second of the sons with the hope that the third will return safely. But we know in hindsight now, the third one did not return safely. And and so, you, 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 I don't know, you, 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 you grieve with the family and the mother. You, like you said, you paint the picture of the mother learning this and, uh, you know, and there were siblings. We know that there was a larger family here and um, the, the two soldiers, uh, Arthur and uh, Robert, I, I guess Robert Jr., because uh, the father is Robert as well, uh, were twins um, and George, the older brother. And, and, but there were others. There was, there was other siblings as well that didn't uh, see service overseas. But 
um, this this must have shaken the family and, and the, the community would have known too, right? Like this is the, the it's a small community and the neighbors would have known and, and just it, it, it breaks your heart. And yet you're only at the beginning of the journey, right? You've got, uh -huh. the, you, there's other articles that will, will come to light and, uh, uh, you know, nothing is ever black and white, I guess, in, in that sense. And particularly Arthur has a journey uh, before him that we'll, we'll highlight. So what, where, what other records did you consult to, to kind well, of paint the picture? The first step was, uh, you know, our local history records that we're accustomed to using at, at, in our archives. So, and you mentioned that the, the Arthur and Robert were twins. And we discovered that just through the census. Well, it, that's a federal record, but we can access it um, through Library and Archives Canada. And we saw they had the same birth year. And, and you know, every step that, that I took, it was like there was a, another revelation that the, the story just kept growing. Somehow the fact that they were twins, it was very poignant. And uh, this kind of slow research that you do with, with archival records, it's not um, like reading history book where the person has already digested the records for you and written a nice, um, nice narrative. The narrative is was yet to be written. And, you know, archival records are sort of like you're looking through um, some blinds through a window and you, you get little glimpses. that you get a different angle from each each slot in the blind. You get you get a, a little piece of the puzzle yeah. and you see only a little bit away in front of you. And somehow that um, that was even more moving. So we, we found there were twins. There was 10, 10 kids in the family. Um, we found that uh, through this sort of standard genealogical databases that the daughter, um, Laura, young daughter, died uh, around the time that Arthur died. Yeah. So of a, of suddenly of a hemorrhage. And so, uh, you know, just absolutely um, a tragic family story. We went to the newspapers. There was nothing about their actual, um, there were no announcements when they, when they died. There was a kind of a global announcement of the, the, the family's overall situation was so tragic that it made the papers. And they said in the papers that um, the last son Arthur had been wounded, gone to England and then returned to battle and died. So I, got, I sort of, put that in my, you know, back pocket and uh, something to investigate. Um, and they mentioned the daughter and said that this family had borne more than, more than their fair share of burdens. Um, other than that, nothing in the newspapers. We went to the William Perkins Bull family file. You, you're probably familiar with that set of family files. A, a, a significant Peel historian did um, exhaust, you know, exhaustive research on the families that he, he that he did research, which was, you know, many, very many of them. Um, so this research dates from the 30s, but goes back to, covers the early settlers forwards. And he had, uh, did not have a file on the Whiteheads. And so the, the you know, the, that's fairly unusual for us yeah. because he was such a, a tenacious researcher. So the mystery deepened. Um, so the next step was going to the military, federal military files in Ottawa on the website of Library and Archives Canada. So um, there are kind of uh, three main sets that family researchers will use. There's the circumstances of death, which would have been, you know, if you want to know how they died, that's the first step. And these were extracted from military records. And uh, they, they say how the person died, where they died, which is something I really wanted to know, and when. And unfortunately, the, the uh, set of records from S to the end of the alphabet were, uh, had gone missing over the years. So uh, that wasn't gonna be easy. Um, so the other two places to go, um, obvious places to go were the personnel files. And that's what, what you might expect. It's, it's what the army had on you. Yeah. Um, shows where you were, what you were doing, any, any interaction you had with, with the military. But it's not a, again, it's not a constructed narrative. You have to piece it together. 
and uh, and then there's the um, the uh, war diaries. And these are, are a little bit more narrative because they were interestingly, they actually were compiled with a view to, to history, which is somewhat unusual. Um, and there's an article at the end of the blog post, which, which will outline um, how Canada's war records were kind of shaped. And it's, it's a very interesting story in itself. But war diaries were not personal diaries, they were diaries of units. So in this case, the, the battalion. And they give a, a day by day narrative summary of what happened in the battalion losses, where they were, what the, what the weather was like. They always open with the weather because there was a scientific um, use for that, you know, visibility and, and conditions for fighting and, and artillery and so forth. So uh, I had to kind of put together the personnel files and the war diaries for their battalions. And um, that's when the story is really opened out. And then the another set of records that is less less uh, seldom used was court martials. And um, I can get to that. Why I went into those. So what what? So it, just in terms of of painting that picture, um, Robert, the one twin, Robert, who dies first of illness uh, of, of pneumonia, I believe he's. Uh, in, in, in Shorncliffe in England, um, he is serving, he enlists on his own and is serving with a different unit where the other two brothers, the, the, second, the other twin, Arthur, and the older brother, George, were at the time of their enlistment living out west and had enlisted and served together in, a, in, in one unit. So you had Robert on his own in one unit and, and, and the, the other two in, in a different unit. Um, you know, we don't know, I guess, if, if Robert had any connection, communication with George and Arthur, you know, like, like that. We, I'm assuming we don't know that. Um, but uh, you, how do you paint that picture in terms of just, you know, where they were, when they went over, what their service was like? Do, do the records show that? Um, they, they, the records are created for, you know, the use of um, the, the vast bureaucracy at the time. And, and, and the, the record keeping uh, mechanism was a machine. It was it was part of the war machine. They couldn't have um, they couldn't have done the maneuvers they did without this kind of meticulous record keeping. And you have these standardized forms that, um, for instance, service records, which show when the when the person um, left Canada, when they arrived in England, when they in, went overseas, and that meant to France to, to the to the front. Uh, when they changed, if they changed units, if they uh, went to hospital, and you have casualty forms that that list uh, sometimes the same thing, um, and then you know deaths and and uh, injuries to some extent, hospital admissions, okay. and it, all, each form has its kind of own use. So there'll be blanks in one form that are filled in with another type of form. There's pay pay information. There's some hospital for, for Robert. There was unusually complete hospital information because he he didn't leave England. So I think he got you know slightly more. Um, they were able to document his illness in, in ways that maybe they weren't at the front. Um, there's attestation forms um, where where. The, when the person enlists, they give their personal information and their agreement, their understanding about what they're, as far as they could know, what they were getting into. And, and those are extraordinarily intimate in some ways. It talks about for identification purposes, because it wasn't easy to take a photograph of every person. Um, exactly what they, their eye color, their height, their, their hair color, their scars, you know, you know where, where the scars were on these boys. They were what you might expect for sort of a, a laboring farmer at the time, because they were all farmers. So I'm just, I, I do want to touch more on Arthur's story uh, in a few moments here, because his, his, his path is not the typical one of, of your average soldier after, after his brother George's death, but we'll touch on that in a moment. But I'm wondering if you can briefly kind of highlight Robert and George's uh, kind of enlistment and service and, and, and where they lie today, and then we'll talk about Arthur. Right. So, so uh, as you mentioned, Robert enlisted the, the earliest of the three and, you know, did not enlist with his twin. His twin enlisted later with George. The two seemed to have been simpatico. 
But uh, Robert enlisted first, um, and he arrived in England in uh, for training at Shorncliffe in uh, early June, um, nineteen sixteen. And uh, about a month later, he reported to hospital. He had been feeling ill for four days, with a uh, cough and um, pain in his chest, and he deteriorated very quickly, and. Um, was diagnosed with pneumonia, which they were able to diagnose at the time um, through microscopic examination. So we have his medical records in quite a bit of detail. So day by day, how he's doing. And, and it really, um, you're sort of, reading someone's medical records is very intimate. And then it ends, died 5.30 on July um, 17th, signed by the you know, the, the attending doctor. Yes. You have his, for 10 days, I believe it's 10 days, his temperature was taken every four hours by, by a nurse, no doubt. All the medication is noted, you know, microscopic doses of strychnine, and um, it's kind of standard at the time, quinine, um, the medication of the time, sponge baths. His temperature goes up to 105. And it, it, it took him... Uh, really a harrowing, harrowingly long time to die. Yeah. And uh, I, I was reading actually a few days ago that that, uh, they, that soldiers were actually quarantined when they got to Shore and Cliff for 28 days. So so it could be that he just never made it out of quarantine. And um, you know you have to you have to think these are these are people who lived in relatively isolated circumstances prior to this. They worked. They had family farm, a large acreage. They may have seen people occasionally at church, which they didn't go to every week uh, because of the, the needs of farming. And all of a sudden they're on these transport ships. And um, illness was the other big killer of, of soldiers be, besides obviously wounding and, and battle. So it, it's no less of a sacrifice. Um, you know, he, he traveled a long way and uh, Never saw a battle. It, 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 there, there are accounts of, of Shore and Cliff that say that you, you could, it was only 20 miles from France. It was just across the English Channel. You could hear the guns. Yeah. So it's, it's rather uh, poignant and, and sad. And he was buried in the Shore and Cliff Military Cemetery with an with a appropriate funeral. And there, there were photographs taken, which is something for the family, I suppose. Um, certainly that didn't happen for the other two. So you can see one of those photographs on the blog post. Yeah. Um, and there are very um, detailed accounts of Shorncliffe um, that, that are noted at the end of the blog post that you can go read. It was a, a very uh, Canadian camp in, in uh, Kent in England on, on the, the, the seashore. So in the process, we during Robert's convalescence and in, in quick order, his passing, where are the other two brothers in the process of their military career? Well, George enlisted before Arthur. Um, but George enlisted in February 16 in Medicine Hat, where the two appear to have gone together. Um, and then his younger brother enlisted in June of that year. Don't know why there's, there is that. Uh, he, he obviously enlisted just before Robert died, in fact. But... but and did not know that was going to happen at the time. And they didn't go uh, to England until October of that year. Um, they may have done a bit of training in Canada, but uh, in Medicine Hat, it may not be likely. And um, they went to a different camp and um, Seaford and trained there for a number of months, about four months, I think, and, and then um, disembarked and, and went to, to France in um, early January the following year. So January 17, they're on the ground in France. Yes. Yeah. Now they would, have had, they would have had some training in trench warfare from the British forces at, at camp and tra training in the you know, industrial military weapons. But they were they weren't professional soldiers, any of them. That's you know we, we didn't say that at the outset. These are all volunteers. They're they're just farmers. They're citizens. These citizen soldiers. Conscription wasn't uh, hadn't been invoked at the time. So, 
So the family would have known by then of, of Robert's passing when the other two boys are, are headed overseas. Uh, yeah, that, that's almost a certainty just because he died in relatively, you know, safe, a safe yeah. environment. And then the Postal Service was, was you know, running quite well. So especially from England to, to Canada, I mean, there were hazards along the way, but... Um, and so, so you have the, these boys now, uh, Arthur and George, uh, uh, are in France in, in January. And of course, we know already from, uh, from what you've said, uh, George will meet his demise in, in a few months' time, uh, end of March of, of 1917. Um, and, and it's believed, I, I think you said, it, it's believed George is kind of that reconnaissance leading up to, uh, up to Vimy. Uh, Vimy, of course, uh, early April of, of 1917. Um, so George is, George passes away, um, and uh, where where is he? Where does he? Uh, uh, where was he buried? He's in uh, in, a, in a military cemetery in France, Equavre, I think yep. it's called. Um, and uh, he, you know, if, if if the officer who wrote to his mother uh, was able to tell the full story, because there was censorship in place. He, uh, he and Arthur had been manning the parapet means you know, that's the front of the trench. So you've got sandbags in front of you. You've got a, you've got a shoulder rest for your rifle. There's probably barbed wire in front of you. And uh, so he would have died in the trench. Right. Um, and uh, Arthur had, had allegedly been ordered to go into a dugout, which is like a hole in the side of the trench. Um, now that night, that the on, on the day that, that this happened, that George died, there was a raid that was conducted by that battalion. We know that from the war diary, and, and raids were a sort of something that the Canadians were particularly connected with. They were kind of a terrifying um, exercise where a small group of soldiers would cross no man's land um, through the barbed wire and, and under cover of darkness and sort of preceded by a hail of their own artillery and uh, tried to capture enemies from the opposing trench and intelligence. And um, there was a lot of these raids just leading up to them. And it's sort of like a preparation. And uh, if, if the, the officer is correct and, and George died at the parapet, it doesn't appear that he went on the raid himself, but certainly there would have been retaliatory fire. Yeah. And um, they do note deaths in the war diary, but not names unless the person is, I think it's, uh, it tends to be your lieutenant or above. Yeah. It's other deaths are notated as OR, other ranks. Yeah. So the war diary wasn't sort of the place where they, they identified names. So he, he, George is killed manning his post, basically. That's mm -hmm. what we That's what we're, we're told anyways. Yeah. Um, and so he, so he passes, leaving Arthur as the sole survivor. And, and, and Arthur, I mean, we, I know you and I have talked a little bit about not, uh, not being aware if there was any PTSD and, and, uh, PTSD, sorry, and, you know, shell shock and, and things like that, because Arthur has a challenging path in front of him. Um, and it, can, you, can you highlight a little bit of, of, of kind of what Arthur goes through? Because, um, again, it, it speaks a little bit, I think, to, to state of mind and to right. the pressures and, of, of life as a soldier. Yeah. And, and you know, it, any, any, any uh, question of what was going on in his head, of course, is this conjecture. But um, he, uh, so he must have fought in the Battle of Vimy Ridge because his battalion was there. You can, you can see the, the locations on the war diary. So that was, the, the battle proper is, is usually noted by historians as the 9th to the 12th of April. Um, and he, so, so you can follow the battalion on um, April 18th, they're at their station at Vimy train station. And the diarist notes that the matter of particularly in a particularly bad way. They're exhausted. The conditions are terrible, mud and rain. They've been dragging the guns through the mud. Um, there's there's no way to cook food. And um, what this corresponds with in Arthur's record is that on April 18th, he, he has what's noted as a self-inflicted gunshot wound. 
And when I saw that, I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. Maybe it means an accident or something. Um, but it, it keeps, uh, they keep emphasizing SIW, self-inflicted, self -inflict, this is all over the record in different different ways. And you know, I'm going through the file and, and um, I should probably circle back at some point and describe what you know the files look like digitally. But um, it turns out he, you know, I, I, there's actually very good paper available from a professor at Western University who's made a special study of self-inflicted wounds in Canadian soldiers, particularly, and it immediately aroused the suspicions of um, the authorities and sort of set you on a path, a collision path with military justice because um, any any hint of sort of dereliction of duty or cowardice was, was seen to be a threat to morale and discipline and it could not stand. So they had to, they had to make an appearance of um, disciplining what could be an attempt to get out of service. Yeah. And there was a, a kind of mythology surrounding self-inflicted wounds that circul circulated among the, the soldiers that this was, uh, people tried to get what's called a blighty. So blighty, yeah. blighty was a, a minor you know, non-life-changing wound that it was honorable, but it, it allowed you to get be evacuated to England where you could recover properly and you know, just get some peace. And um, everybody wanted a blighty, and uh, there was no shame about that. But what was shameful was just to try to give yourself one. There wasn't a lot of sympathy with that. Shell shock was, you know, increasingly recognized um, over the course of the war. It wasn't called obviously PTSD. Yeah. There wasn't. I, I wouldn't say there was a whole lot of sympathy with it for it. It was uh, considered a weakness, and. Um, but they don't seem to have, from what I read in the in scholarly literature, they don't seem to have connected self-inflicted wounding with shell shock. Yeah. They simply dealt with um, self-inflicted wounds as a potential way of trying to get out of doing your duty. And it was dealt with accordingly. So in, in his instance, he um, his story was that he was in, in a trench, they were under, under heavy fire. He went to clean his rifle, pointing it downwards towards his left foot. Didn't realize there was, um, it was loaded, it went off and blew, essentially blew off one of his toes. He had a witness and it was important that you had a witness if you didn't, you know, be, because um, otherwise you could, uh, it, it was difficult to establish that you were in fact, it wasn't in fact an accident if you didn't have a witness. So he, when he was, he went to hospital, um, they did, they did, you know, treat you. What I read is that there was a special sort of segregated, segregated section for self-inflicted wounds where they weren't necessarily treated the same and they tended to get infected. And unfortunately, that seems to be what happened to him. So he was, uh, there's a court of inquiry, which was, that was usually in, in hospital and doctors contributed to that. And they would, this is what I read, not from his records, but from, again, from the literature, they would examine things like um, powder, powder stains on your clothing to see how, you know, was this enemy fire, was this fire at short range and, um, Maybe state of mind had something to do with it. I don't know. But um, in the end, he was court-martialed as a result of the court of inquiry. So, uh, and then I, that led me to the court-martial records right. where we, we actually hear his voice. So there's a short statement in mitigation of his punishment, um, which said that at the time we were being heavily fired on and I was much excited, i.e. agitated or, you know, yeah. um, and that's all, that's all he says. He doesn't bring up um, his loss previous to that. Uh, his witness speaks and says, yes, he was cleaning his rifle. I, I saw him do it. And he said he hurt himself and uh, we were in a trench. So he was sentenced, uh, he pled guilty and uh, was sentenced to 28 days um, field punishment number one, which, uh, had a bit of notoriety. It was um, 
it took over from flogging, which, you know, <laughs> in, in 1880, it, 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 the flogging was abolished in the British Army, and this, this was one of the substitutions, so in that, <laughs> good, it was an improvement on that front. I mean, that, that's a better thing, yeah, okay, <laughs> go with that. Um, so, it's basically, um, if, if, if they could prove that beyond a shadow of doubt if, that you had injured yourself to escape battle, you would have, you could be charged with a section 18 offense, I think, which was um, disgraceful conduct. And that was a very serious offense. If they couldn't prove um, beyond a shadow of a doubt that it, that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't deliberate. They charged you with section 40, which was, um, acting contrary to military discipline or something like that it, it was still considered negligent like it was a, it wasn't encouraged to have, have an accident because it took you you know you were a commodity and it took you out of took you out of battle and and harmed the army so under section 40 he was sentenced to 28 days field punishment um that was nicknamed crucifixion by you know the, in the half jocular way that, that soldiers had at the time because earlier in, in the use of this punishment, your arms were outstretched and you were tied to a fixed object uh, in, in a public place. So it was, it was a form of shaming. Um, you had to stand up, you, you couldn't move. This was two hours a day, um, three out of every four days. The rest of the time, uh, there's sort of, uh, you were either doing like manual labor or heavy labor or you were imprisoned it seems to have depended on on the, the situation and you usually forfeited some pay but so he was sentenced to that uh but almost immediately his wound became very septic so he's back in hospital for several months and in august he's evaluated by a medical board who says he's now fit to undergo punishment he's healed and I'm surmising that in that time is when he underwent punishment. Right. So this is a fellow who's, you know, basically seen his brother killed more or less in front of him. Fights through Vimy Ridge, which I think 10,000 Canadians were lost. And um, for whatever reason, injures himself and now is you know, tied up in the field. Um, so that's uh, Arthur's unfortunate trajectory. Yeah. And um, it doesn't appear to me from his records that he ever made it back to England. In fact, um, and this, this was um, so, you know, a little bit disturbing. There, there's a the hospital transfer form where the medical officer writes at the top of the form in red ink, self-inflicted. And at the bottom of the form, this man must not be evacuated to England. So they're not rewarding it in that sense in terms of a no. military justice. It's, uh, so so he does return. I mean, after his punishment, he is back in action with with his unit. Uh, and eventually, all, is, is all, it succumbs the, the, to the following war. year, yeah. yeah. And and he's he's not killed, in, in as far as I can tell, in any sort of major offensive. It's a relatively quiet day. Um, and the, the reality at the front was that death could come at any time. It was arbitrary. Um, yeah. There was there was shrapnel. There were snipers, and they actually called. Uh, there was this kind of loss every day. There was a trickle of people. Uh, they they they. I think it was ten percent per month per unit. It's called. They called it wastage, which is a rather horrible term. Yes. You know, not, not dying in major offensives or raids, but just being picked off. Yeah. And that appears to be you know, what happened to him. So he's in Sucari uh, Cemetery in, in, in France. You just, that, that you, you wonder about the state of mind. I know it's, I know it's, uh, you know, we're guess, guessing at something like this, but, you know, to having lost, a, lost his twin already, which he probably knew about, his his bro older brother George dying, like you said, probably right in front of him or close by. Uh, to going through Vimy, to the, the trauma that that probably incurred in your own mental processes, self inflicted wound, septic in hospital, punished, returning to action, like you, you just you you that that and that constant fear that would hang over a soldier of this 
of this daily threat to life. I mean, just, I mean, it, it had to be just unending. And, and you, you just wonder again that, that, you know, not only the story of Arthur, but, you know, every soldier who lived through multiple years of conflict must have just, you know, chafed away at your mental stability and uh, your, your, your management of stress and, and the like. And yeah. so you, you just, it, it is no wonder that there's, there's the soldiers are affected in such was in such ways so so arthur has has passed away now in our in our narrative here and and uh, so the, all three brothers and the family are informed but we know from what you mentioned earlier that a sister also passes away at home suddenly uh, so we have you know the loss of four children in a family in a short period of time um what about what do we know or do we know much of the family that is left behind we we don't so far um they, they, there's not a lot of, that we can find in the newspapers. Um, they, it seems that for whatever reason, they, they noted their mother as the next of kin on all their kind of military forms. Uh, it may have been because she was more literate than the father, but it, it meant that she was kind of bearing the burden of all this correspondence. It was all addressed to her. And uh, we can see that they, they continue, they're still on the land in the 30s. Um, but uh, I, I, yeah, we don't know much, not, you know. So perhaps that's a, that's a really good segue to any listeners mm -hmm. out here who might be connected to the family or know of them is, you know, please reach out and share that story. We've certainly highlighted the, the, the life and times that we know of in terms of the soldiers. Uh, the three the three brothers, but uh, you know, help us learn more about the family and uh, you know who they were and uh, maybe even where they went. Uh, you know, the, the entire family didn't disappear; they just disappeared, perhaps from Peel. So we're trying to figure out uh, right. their path. So, yeah. how do people get in touch with you and uh, kind of explore uh, the, these histories? Um, we can be reached. Probably the best way is email right now, um, yeah. just because of the situation with the world and. Um, and we do have a renovation going on at the moment. So unfortunately we're not open to the public, but we're available digitally and we try to help out as much as we can that way. So um, Pama archives at peelregion.ca is the best email because then we all see the incoming emails. And uh, there are also resources on our website under archives research at Pama. So we can put those links up. It just it, and we'll share those links as well and just the um the you know it, the pama has some incredible records obviously but but I, i've always said and uh maybe a bad segue but i just did a, a survey for pama and i said the, the the best part about pama's records are the help that staff provide <laughs> and, and the guidance that staff <laughs> That's good provide. To know, yeah. uh and and I, I think those uh you know, remar remarkable resources, but remarkable guidance to to access those resources, and I think that's part of the gems of, of, of Pama. And of course, you have other records for certainly families, but also other military records as well, and uh, and always good to to consult. But you know, we, we'd invite anyone with knowledge of the Whitehead family to reach out and uh, and connect. Yes, and please. Let's, yeah. let's you know, let's 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 open the story up even more and see mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we can find out and. Uh, um, it is, I, I can feel why this resonated with you. It, it comes through your words and, uh, you know, it, it probably still hasn't let you go to this day. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah. It's one of those, um, I, mean, I think it's, uh, there's, there's a couple of, of ways in which, um, I think it's helpful to think about things like this. So, um, you know, I've, I've always been a bit not inspired by the idea that that people people who live on in your memory or you know never die um because i don't think a person's value is predicated on you know how much people remember them yeah. and that you know being alive is, is not the same thing as, as existing in someone's memory but on the other hand i think we're we're made of each other to some extent you know we're made of the stories that we take in and, and the people we know and every time you do a bit of archival research and somebody's life kind of passes through your hands or a, a, a little glimpse of it, it changes who you are. Yeah. And I know, you know, a, a, a Canadian thinker um, has said that we live in a mass age. So everything is, is not, it, we don't measure things on a human scale anymore. And the, the World War One, the First World War is, or First World War is a, an instantiation of that, that the numbers are, we can't take we can't take them in 
So 60,000 uh, Canadian soldiers, quarter of a million um, United Kingdom. And it, it can just blur and become dehumanizing. And when you, when you focus on an individual, uh, it, it becomes, it, 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 you, you realize what it's really all about. I, I know for me, and I, and I feel your words very much so, and, and uh, you know, the concept of remembering our fall, and for me, it's the pictures, it's the faces, and, mm -hmm. and you realize that they cease to become words, right. this is a person who once looked like this, uh, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. to me, that helps highlight the story, and, you know, thankfully, we know that Perkins Bull, one of the mysteries, I guess, is that we know that Perkins Bull didn't record or reference the Whitehead family, yet in his book, are the pictures of the three right whitehead boys right. Um, and so right. somebody shared those pictures with them yeah he, he he did reach out to families actively has huge correspondence he must have i'm assuming reached out to the family or somebody who had these pictures um published them and he, he has a book on canada's military or appeals military history and uh they are sort of in one of the plates in the book but he does not write about them. He writes about other privates, other soldiers. This is, this is, you know, three losses in one family, I would think would be something that he would write about. You'd think. Um, and I just wonder whether something of Arthur's story was known or, and if there was an element of uh, shame, I, I maybe I, I could be wrong about that. And maybe it's, yeah. um, the other strange thing is the newspaper saying he went back to England and, and then, you know, evacuated to England, then went back to fight. And that just did not happen. It would have been in his record for sure. Right. Well, you just, it's also, as far as we know, when we look at, you know, major uh, um, conflicts, First World War, Second World War particularly, no other family suffers three losses like the Whiteheads did. They, they, they yeah. are the single highest uh, casualty okay. rate for any, any single family. We know of a family in Port Credit, the Duncan family, where two sons were killed and a third son was wounded. Uh, the Thompson family, where two sons were killed in action. And, and you know, they, they, but there's more recorded on them. The Whiteheads, this farming family from Malton, uh, very little known about them. Um, and yet, you know, three casualties, uh, you know, a single casualty you don't wish on any family, but here is one with three. And then you count the daughter who dies around the same period of time as Arthur. And, and there's four out of a family of uh, 10 children, I think you said. And, and uh, you know, just, you don't wish that on anybody. The, the, the amount of, of anger, angst is the wrong word, but uh, at home, uh, just from those losses, is just astounding. It's yeah, and, and you know, it did make the papers sort of at the time, but uh, since then, it, they've been a kind of lonely, lonely voice sort of waiting to be heard. It, it felt, uh, it felt like I had to, I had to, I, had, I wanted them to be seen. So, um, well, you know, just on behalf of myself and, you know, who loves to wander down history and trying to explore these stories and, and think we're, I, I do believe it, it is on us to remember those that came from this place and, and served it. You know, thank you. Uh, it, it, it was an incredible journey to, to go with on you with the, with the blog post that you've done, but to, to have you share that story here and, and, uh, Again, I invite anyone listening who has more information on the family, on the soldiers, on any fallen soldier from Peel, uh, you know, reach out, connect, uh, let us know, um, uh, help tell that story, help share those memories and, and put, put faces to names and stories to, stories to, to faces and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all important and, and kudos to you, kudos to Pama, I know you're upside down in a renovation right now and uh, never the easiest thing to go through but well, uh, if we're talking kudos there's also massive kudos to library and archives canada because um the the files that i use were also you know i didn't travel to ottawa yes not, not these days that they were all available digitally now now not all archival records are available digitally i have to to, to caution on that they have they put a huge push on making those available um because of the anniversary of the war i believe yeah. And also um, because we're, you know, the veterans now, um, I, I, have we lost the last uh, First World War veterans? Yes, yeah, there yeah. are more yeah. living, yeah. 
Yeah, so they have done a fantastic job, especially with the personnel files. Um, they are full color. It's the next best thing to holding the file, you, even the envelope they've done. So you can see you know, if you were holding it, what it would look like. Yeah. Um, so they're PDFs, you can download them, you have the regimental number, you can, uh, regimental number is a key because a lot of these guys, they were, they're similar names, so they were, might have been, you know, five George Whitefields and Whitehead, so, yeah. you know, that, that's the key, and um, that that's an enormous amount of work, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, it's obvious to, to a lot of people, but keeping all the data attached to the files and making them available. It's, it's a huge amount of work, so. Well, and just the sheer number of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Canadian soldiers overall. I know we had 60,600 and some odd casualties. Right. We, you know, you had, you know, the sheer number of soldiers that served is, is, is astounding. Um, so with that, I, I want to, you know, thank you so very much for, for taking the time to share this with us and to explore the story of, the, of uh, Robert, Arthur and George Whitehead from Malton. Um, and uh, in the midst of the upside down of a renovation, keep your head above water and, you know, keep on the great work with the Region Field Archives because it truly is a gem in our, in our community and uh, a resource that I count on innumerable times. For, oh, that's for, great uh, to hear. Thank you. Um, so, you know, with that, I, I just want to thank our, our listeners to, uh, for connecting with us here at Ask a Historian. Uh, keep sending in your questions. Uh, we'll explore different facets of, of local history. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions as well for, uh, for Pama and, and the archives team at, at, uh, at the Region Appeal Archives, you know, reach out to, uh, to, to Pama as well and, uh, you know, keep exploring local history. So, Thank you for joining us for Ask a Historian and keep sending in your questions. Like, subscribe, and follow us here and stay up to date on heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. And we will see you each and every week with Ask a Historian.